Some people have a real gift at taking something that's very simple and making it very complex. Now, most of the time, we're, usually, we're very annoyed by that kind of a person. Like, thanks for taking something that I thought I understood and making me not understand it anymore, right? But over the years, a lot of comedians have got a lot of miles on that very concept. I think as a, as a child, uh, and this is certainly before my time, I'm not that old, but watching black and white Laurel and Hardy clips. And I remember one in particular where Laurel and Hardy, they have this piano and they're supposed to be delivering this piano. And there's this hill that seems like a mile long and high. And they're like taking this piano and through a whole bunch of issues and problems, they keep trying to get up and, get, and it falls down. And they keep having all these issues and then, and then like three quarters of the way through the clip, it's like they see a driveway at the top and they could have driven around and just delivered it at the top and, and been done with it, you know. But then we wouldn't have, you know, a half an hour comedy sketch, you know. Um, but uh, taking something that's simple and making it very complex. Now, there's also people that are the opposite, right? That can take something very, very complex and, and teach it to us and present it to us in a way that's very, very simple, and that is extremely helpful. Albert Einstein said this once. He said, the definition of genius is taking the complex and making it simple. That's how he defined uh, what it means to be a genius. We're going to look at a passage today at the end of John 16, if you have your Bibles. John 16 and right into the beginning of John 17. And I want to look with you at a passage where Jesus is going to speak about complex things and begin to show the disciples the simplicity of them. And he's going to promise the coming day where I believe he's talking about the Spirit coming and the Spirit is going to take complex truths and teach them with amazing clarity. Now we're going to look today at that as we think about Easter Sunday and the all the complex things that surround Easter and Jesus and a relationship with God, we're going to look at three amazing benefits that Jesus clearly lays out in this passage for us that we have because of Easter. What are these three benefits? Let's read this passage starting in verse 25 of chapter 16 down to verse 5 of chapter 17. The scripture says this, These things... I've spoken to you in figurative language. But the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. For in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray to the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, See, now you're speaking plainly and using no figurative speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I want to speak to you about these three benefits of Easter. The first is found in verse 25 to 30, and it's this. It's that we have access to God. 
we have access to Almighty God. Jesus, it says, I'm going to start speaking in, there's a time coming soon when no longer is going to be figurative language. If you know much about Jesus' Passion Week, the week leading up to his death and resurrection, he spoke a number of parables in Jerusalem. A number of things that were hard to understand. And throughout his ministry, many times speaking to parables, the disciples would come aside and say, hey, Jesus, what in the world did you mean by that? And he would explain to disciples about what these parables are. Uh, in John 13 that we looked at a few weeks ago as we're looking at these last-minute lessons of Jesus from John 13 to John 17, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And after he washed their feet, he says, do you know what I've done to you? They're like, like this was a living picture. Like, they, he had done something, and he's like, do you understand what that means? He had taught to them in various pictures, figurative language, even right here in John 16, before the passage that we just read, he has used an illustration of, you're going to be sorrowful as I leave. And then you're going to have joy, and I'm going to leave and come, and they're confused what's going on here. And he uses this figurative language of a, a woman who gives birth. All the pains and the sorrow and the hardships of giving birth, and then when she welcomes into her arms a baby, she quickly, like that pain and sorrow is quickly out of the picture, and she has joy. He's, he's used figurative language all throughout this, and he says there's coming a day soon where there's no more figurative language, where there's going to be all the complex is going to be made simple, right? And, and he begins to even talk that way right here in this passage, He's speaking about a day where after he has died and risen again, things are going to start to make sense. All that he's taught leading up to this moment, and he's been talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's been talking about this this whole passage. He's going to guide you into all truth. And so when all those things happen, there's going to be such clarity to all the complex issues that I've been teaching of, Jesus says here. You see, there's a lot of confusion that's been around through the centuries for mankind. Why is that? From the very beginning, mankind has had confusion and chaos. Well, not from the very beginning, right? Because back in the very beginning, Genesis 1, God created the world, and he put Adam and Eve in that world to enjoy him and to walk and talk with him. In fact, the scriptures describe to us in the opening scenes of Genesis that Adam and Eve literally walked and talked with their maker. I mean, it's hard for us to get our minds around it, isn't it? Like walking and talking with God, like you do with the best friend out on a walk on a pleasant afternoon. There was this fellowship and this joy and this union, this, this beauty that they shared together, this daily fellowship that they got to spend with their creator. And we turn the page to Genesis chapter 3. Get it right? Flop that next one up. Genesis 3. And in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, instead of listening and trusting the, the, the God who said, hey, there's all these infinite yeses, but there's one no, they did what? They did the one no, distrusting God, going their own way, and, and there's been massive repercussions because of it since then. There's been confusion and, and hiding and, and, and all the things that we've, been, we've distanced ourselves from God. We've had conflict with each other because of the effects of, of that moment. We've been born now, according to Adam, and in his sin, in his flesh, we've been walking in that moment ever since. And, and you see, our hearts, though, continually ache for that clarity and that fellowship that we want with God. We want that. We yearn for it. Our hearts long for it. And along the way, we've tried a host of ways to get there. The most common way we've tried as a, as a, as a people, mankind, the human race, to, to get back in this fellowship with God is we've come up with this thing called religion. Like, I'm going to come up with a system whereby if I do enough of this and, and less and less of that, I can measure up, I can kind of get up there to where I can start to have fellowship with God again. I can find my way back to God if I just do enough. You see, that's the common theme of all the systems of religion around the world. 
if you can just do enough, God will accept you. That's, that's the theme, right? I, if I can do enough good, that way the bad, I can, I can, like God will accept at a certain point, keep trying hard, and if you do enough, you can measure up to God. That's what we've done. We've created this, and, and that is not at all what the Scripture says is your way back to God. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus speaks about access to God that is forthcoming. It's, it's right here. The time is coming, he says. And he says here what? Not only do you have clarity, but in that day, verse 26, you will ask in my name, you'll talk to God in the name of Jesus. And what's going to happen? He says, I don't, I'm not even going to have to step in to pray for you so that you'll have access. This says, you're going to pray in the name of Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm not going to have to step in and go, oh, yeah, yeah, you should listen to him. You should listen to her. You should, God, you should listen to them. He's not going to have to step in for you. You are going to talk to God Almighty, and he's going to hear you. You're going to have access to God himself. It's an amazing concept in this passage, access to God. You see, I believe he's talking about this passage, this hour that's coming, this, this time that's approaching, he says, in verse 25. I believe he's speaking about his death and resurrection. In fact, he's, predi he's predicted it many times throughout the Gospel of John and the other Gospels, leading up to his death and resurrection. He said, there's coming a day, this is going to happen I'm going to die, and in three days I'll rise again. He said it in chapter 8, 28, in chapter 12, 27, and 36. He's talked this way all the way along. In verse 25, he says that time is coming. You know, all the way in, in John's gospel, there's this, been this concept of there's a certain day approaching. There's a certain day approaching. Remember back in chapter 2, the first miracle of Jesus, he turns water into wine. And, and, and during that time, his mom, Mary, says, hey, kind of show him who you are. Like, show him, son. Like, put yourself on display. And what does Jesus say there? Jesus says, my time is not yet, verse 24. Verse 4, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 4. Chapter 7, an angry mob has cornered Jesus, and they're going to try to kill him. And what happens? Somehow Jesus slips out of that angry mob, and he escapes. And the scripture says, it didn't just happen because Jesus was like Houdini. It says Jesus did this because his hour had not yet come. Chapter 7, verse 30. There's been this, uh, this sight on this something's coming. Something very significant and powerful is, is going to happen, but it's not yet. It's not yet. It's not yet. And in this passage, he says in verse 25, that time is coming. And then verse number uh, 20, what is it here, 26, he says what? Th th in that day, it's gonna, this, you're going to ask, excuse, excuse me, verse uh, number 32, indeed the hour is coming, yes, has now come. It's here. It's upon us. It's right here in this passage. The, that the time has been approaching, but it's right here in front of us. It has now come. He's speaking about his, his death and his resurrection and all that that's going to bring for his disciples along with the coming of the Spirit. This amazing benefit in, in this passage is all that is going to mean that you and I have access to God Almighty. Verse 26, you're going to speak to him, and he's going to hear you without an intermediary, which again was unheard of in those days. The Old Testament picture of God's presence was where? It was in a tabernacle in the middle of camp, and later when Jerusalem becomes the capital, the temple is built in the center of town. And it's this Jesus, and God's presence was pictured in the temple. But as we talked about last week about the veil in the temple, did anyone just get to waltz in there and say, hey, I'd like to talk? No. Not even, 
Yet the high priest once a year would go into that place. You, had, you did not have access. I mean, you didn't have access to any king in those days, let alone the king of kings. You didn't have access religiously to God Almighty. So, so Jesus says here, you're going to talk to God, and you're not going to need any appointment. You're not going to need any intermediary. This is what you have. You have access to God in the name of Jesus because of what Jesus is going to accomplish in his death and resurrection. It is ridiculous. It's a ridiculous claim that Jesus offers to anyone because of what he is about to accomplish. And I want you to notice here in verse number 27, there's a phrase here as he kind of explains a little bit further. He says, verse 27, for the Father himself loves you. For the Father himself loves you. I found it a very interesting phrase this week. And it's a phrase that I think helps to clarify the gospel, what we call the good news about Jesus Christ. Because sometimes, even in churches, we, we, there's a slight twist that happens with this presentation of the gospel. What do I mean by that? Some places, some churches will say, God loves you, Because Christ died for you. God loves you because Christ died for you. The subtle idea is that that God Almighty, He really, really doesn't love you. But like because Jesus did this death thing and kind of twisted the Father's arm, He's like, you got to like that guy now because of Jesus. Folks, that is not... The, the, the testimony of the scriptures. Even earlier in John's gospel, what does John say? John says in John 3, 16, you probably have heard of this verse before. For God so loved the world that he gave, right? So, so this is what happens, right? In our minds, sometimes as believers, we're like, God doesn't really love me but like Jesus did that and I've prayed in Jesus' name and and now he has to kind of like me. John 3.16 says, we we sometimes get this twisted and we say, God, Jesus died, therefore God loves me. What does does John 3.16 in this passage, verse 27, for the Father himself loves you. It says actually it's the other way around. That God loves and because of God's amazing love, he did what? He sent his son Jesus to die for you and me. It's a subtle thing, folks, but, but it, this is something we get twisted in our head and we get it backwards. And some of you struggle with doubt. Some of you struggle with anxiety. Some of you struggle with weak faith, a lack of assurance, no joy in your faith because you have this concept of God the Father doesn't really like me but he kind of has to through Jesus, so I kind of think I stay under this Jesus umbrella. Now listen, is God a holy God? Yes. Does God hate sin? If we sin, yeah, there's, this, there's this, okay, so this nuance of truth here, but God loves the world. And because of his amazing love, yes, he's holy, but because of his amazing love, he sent Jesus. The Father himself loves you, verse 27. And he's shown that love, not, not, he doesn't love because of Jesus. Because of his love, he has sent Jesus. Because of his love, he has sent his son to die in your place and mine. He offers forgiveness. Yes, we've sinned. We need restoration. We need forgiveness. And a holy God cannot just overlook our sin. But because of his love, he sent Jesus to pay the penalty for your sin and for mine. Folks, this is something that, that because of, of this t- slight twist, a lot of issues have arisen. And, and I, I just remind you of this. You might need to take this phrase this week. You might need to write it down. You might need to say it to yourself daily. You might need to put it over your door. You might need to say, for the Father himself loves you. That's what the text says. The Father himself loves loves you. And we have access to the Father, God Almighty, because he loves us and because 
because of that love, he has sent his son Jesus to open the way so that you now, in Jesus' name, walk directly to access with the Father. You don't need an intermediary. You don't need a priest to stay in the temple and to kind of pray on behalf of you to God. You can go directly to him. You have access to the Father because of Easter, because of the glory of this truth that Jesus died and rose again and and offers you the restoration of that relationship. The second thing I want to think about with you from this passage is the idea of action. Not only have we have access with God, but there's action. The second benefit of Easter is, in verse 31 to 33, is that you and I now live. We now act. We now live in such a way that pleases God. Action always follows faith. But it's powerful in this passage is, is how this is displayed for us. This section, verse 31 to 33, directly follows a statement by the disciples. The disciples have heard some of this beginning of plain teaching by Jesus, and they say, aha, now we know you're the one. And now we really believe. We, we really believe this stuff. And Jesus asks what in verse 31? Like, like, do you really get it? Do you really believe? Verse 31 I mean, the implication of the disciples is, hey, we really get it. We're going to follow you to the end. We're going to live for you. We're going to do this stuff. But, but Jesus says, are, are you really going to live this way? Are you really going to walk in this belief that you claim to have? And Jesus goes on to say what? It, it's, now, the time's now here that this all is going to take place. And when that happens, you all are going to forsake me. You're all going to leave. He's not just talking to Peter that he's already mentioned. He's now talking to all the disciples. Every one of you are going to go your own way. It's a fulfillment of Zechariah 13, verse 7. In Zechariah, the Old Testament prophet writes, Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. That's exactly what's taking place here in this passage. The shepherd, Jesus, is going to be struck, and all the sheep are going to run away. That's what's going to take place. Jesus is going to be left completely alone. But the Father, it says, is still with him. You see, in this moment of being alone, no one's there to help. No one's there to support. When Jesus is completely alone, what's going to happen? The beauty is in this passage, and as it goes through its fulfillment in Jesus' actions, is Jesus, the second Adam, is not going to fail like the first Adam. Adam and Eve tested by God, don't eat of this forbidden fruit, trust me. And they say, we're not going to trust you, we're going to do our own thing. The second Adam, he's tested and he's all alone. He has to face this test by himself. And what is he going to do? He's going to succeed where the first Adam failed. He's going to overcome the world and bring peace, verse number 33. And the point of this whole passage is that when we think about salvation and we think about believing in Christ and then walking in his ways, we've sometimes just jumbled this whole thing up. That it's it's about our effort and our, our, you know, goodness and our belief. Try harder. The point in this passage is it's not about you and your strength. The gospel is about Christ and all that he has done. Because we are like the disciples We have all left. We've all gone our our own way. We've all taken the forbidden fruit. We've all done this. Not one cleaned up person in here has not gone astray like a sheep walks away from their shepherd once he gets struck. And the point of this passage is only Christ was faithful. Only Christ action lived out not just some faith that was claimed, but Jesus all alone is the overcoming Savior in this passage. And only humble faith based on his finished work is going to allow you and I to live victoriously in our life. The Christian faith is not merely about some mind game, some, some you know, thought process where we kind of like you know, talk heavenly, It's about a faith that believes 
and then lives, acts in such a way that honors God. But it's not, it's not ever possible in your own strength. Not ever possible in your own strength. The gospel is about what Jesus did, his sinless life, his sacrificial death, and his powerful resurrection. That's what the gospel is about. And it highlights in this passage the fallenness of mankind to go astray, to leave Jesus, to claim faith and then say, ah, when things get hard, I'm going to leave. The disciples in this passage had immature and overconfident faith. Yes, we're going to believe. Yes, we're going to follow you. And then they all go astray. But you see, the disciples who had this immature faith, they're going to scatter, but what's God going to do? God the Son is going to go to the cross. He's going to die, and he's going to rise again. And then he's going to restore these wayward sheep. And these, these wayward sheep that go their own way, they're going to be the ones that turn the world upside down. Not on this side of the, of the cross, but on the other side. They're going to say, he did what he said he was going to do. He was the faithful one. He kept all his words. He was true. We were not. But we are going to walk with him. We're going to, we're going to believe truly now. And because of his death and resurrection, we're going to walk in a way that pleases God. And by the resurrection power that Jesus put on display, weak faith, humble faith now that believes in Jesus is going to live in this way. It's going to walk in such a way that the world says, who are these guys? They turn the world upside down. You see, the Christian life is a life of obedience, of action that glorifies God. But it's only possible through the finished work, the transforming work of Jesus. It's not in your willpower or your strength or your performance. If you believe that, you're sadly mistaken that the Christian life is about you trying harder, you having more willpower, you having some measure of accountability. None of that is going to fix the deep damage of your sinful heart. Only the cross and the resurrection power of Jesus can transform your heart. Jesus in this passage was obedient and faithful. The disciples were not. But we believe and we live in light of our overcoming Savior. Because of Easter, you and I can live victorious Christian lives. This passage describes for us. We have access to God. That's to follow in action with humble faith and the finished work of Jesus. Now let me look with you in the last section here, chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. It, it's this concept of, I just want to just stop and say, it, it's, it's a word, I use the word awe here, awe. When it comes to Jesus, we have, most people have kind of pushed Jesus off to obscurity. And the only time they use Jesus' name is in some kind of a curse word. Even those who value, they say they value Jesus, most of the time it's simply like, Jesus, you can be in the passenger seat of my life. Like you could be on the journey with me, but like if I, if I need your help or guidance, I'll ask for it. Like just sit there and just be on the journey with me, yeah, but, but uh, like speak when spoken to. That's how we've kind of relegated Jesus to the passenger seat. And, and in this passage, I just want to, I just want to encourage you and I to just step back and stand in awe of Jesus Christ. Just be in awe of him. This opening chapter of, this opening passage of chapter 17 is this opportunity for us to listen in on the longest prayer of Jesus recorded in the scriptures. John 17 is a prayer of Jesus to God. We see it in verse 1 here, right? He lifts his eyes to heaven and says, oh, Father, right? I mean, he's speaking in a prayer here, what we often call the high priestly prayer of Jesus. We call it that because it really mirrors the high priestly prayer of the high priest back in Jesus' day. You see, as I mentioned earlier, the high priest was only the one that could go into that back part of the temple, known as the Holy of Holies, behind the curtain. He did it one time a year. And there was a number of things to prepare for that, that moment to go back into the Holy of Holies. And he would do ritual cleansing. He, there would be sacrifice. But one of the things that the high priest would do is he would spend the night before completely in prayer. Okay? 
the high priest would spend a night in prayer. And what he would do is he would start out in the first part of that night and he would pray for about himself and his relationship with Almighty God. He would then pray for the priests and the other folks that were serving in the temple. And then at the, by the end of the, the night, in the early morning hours, he would pray for all the people. If you look at this passage of Scripture, you may have uh, like captions above the different sections of chapter 17. You see here in verse 1, it says, my Bible says, over top of verse 1, it says, Jesus prays for himself. Over verse 6, it says, Jesus prays for his disciples. And then over verse 20, it says, Jesus prays for all believers. Now, this is not inspired. Those aren't inspired captions. That's just what my Bible kind of outlines the paragraphs. But you see here, Jesus prays in his relationship with God. He prays for disciples, and he prays for the world, just like the high priest did in that night of prayer before he enters the Holy of Holies. We get a moment here to just listen in. I'm only going to cover the first five verses. I encourage you if you uh, to read this whole passage. But, but Jesus here in the opening five verses is like just talking, like this is inter-Trinitarian conversation. Like take a moment to just be in awe of who Jesus is in, in this conversation in the Godhead here. That we get a moment to listen in. And I, this is this amazing benefit of Easter. Because of the cross and resurrection, you and I get this chance to see Jesus for who he really is. We get a chance to just, and we ought to be driven to awe before Jesus Christ. One of the things that's, that's, that, that kind of shows us who Jesus is in this passage, we want to stand in awe of him for, is there's a repeated phrase throughout these first five verses, and that is glory. Glory, glory. Use it over and over again in this passage. Jesus prays toward heaven as his hour, the time of his cross and resurrection are upon him. And I want you to just notice here that Jesus has a very different view. And I'd say God has a very different view of this hour than anybody did in Jesus' day. When it comes to the cross, Jesus prays, glorify, the hour has come, glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you. Jesus sees in this moment of time, as he comes, he's going to go to the cross, and in that moment he prays what? God, would you glorify me as I glorify you? He's speaking about his death on a cross. Glory. Jesus describes it as a place where glory is going to be on display. Folks, the cross was a symbol of shame, of rejection, of death. And Jesus is going to take that image and he's going to transform it into a symbol of honor, a symbol of acceptance, a symbol of life-giving power. Jesus is going to do that in these upcoming moments. The image of cross is going to change from this point forward from a symbol, a repulsive symbol, to a symbol of acceptance, a symbol that women wear around their necks on a Sunday morning, right? This is what the cross has changed to because of Jesus Christ. Verse 1, glorify your son and your son will glorify you. He's speaking about, number one, his completed mission. This idea of glory, he's speaking about his completed mission. Jesus' death was not a colossal accident. Like, whoops, I didn't know it would come to this. It was the culmination of all of history. We mentioned Genesis a moment ago. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, right after the fall, God himself gives this glimmer of hope to mankind. He says that a son of Eve is going to come and is going to crush the head of the serpent. What's going to happen when he crushes the head of that serpent? The serpent is going to strike his heel. It's the illustration that, that is kind of, again, figuratively given in the Old Testament. This head-crushing son of Eve, yet venomous bite is going to strike him. 
This picture here is the venomous bite of sin and death that he's going to receive as he does what? As he crushes the head of the serpent through his death and through his resurrection. Jesus came to fulfill the prophecies as old as Genesis 3, 15. It speaks here of his completed mission that Jesus came to die for mankind. This is God's glory. But secondly, also after his mission, the scripture says that he's going to go home to the Father here in this passage. Notice in verse 5, Jesus prays that, that God, after his mission is complete, that he'll be welcomed back into his rightful place in glory, in heaven itself. It speaks about the eternality of the Son. It's not that Jesus like becomes God. Jesus is the eternal Son of God who took on flesh. What does it say here in this passage, right? He, but, that you will, I'll return to the glory that I had before the world existed. He's, he's the eternal Son of God. And he's going to go back to that eternal state that he's been in the eternity past. He's going to go back to it, be welcomed back to glory, return to heaven. Heaven and glory are his right and his dominion. Glory is not something he has to kind of try to get to, a certain place in heaven that the disciples are going, can I sit at your right hand, your left hand? Jesus' rightful place is glory. Jesus' rightful place is rule and reign in heaven. That is who Jesus is. He deserves glory, and he's one day going to return to his home, this text says, soon after the resurrection. I just want to pause and say this idea of glory, man, you and I ought to stand in awe of him. We don't do enough of this, and even churches, is just stand in awe of who Jesus is. God in the flesh, full of glory. But I want you to also notice in this passage the grace of Jesus Christ, the grace. He's not only glorious, but he's full of grace. Verse 2 says what about him here? Verse 2 says that he has all authority, the authority over all the human race. He has complete and utter authority. Well, what kind of authority is this? Keep reading in the passage, the authority to do what? To give eternal life. Jesus alone holds this authority to hand out, if you will, eternal life. Well, what does this mean? Verse 3, this idea of knowing God, knowing your creator, verse 3. Not just know about him, but personally know him. We talked about the beginning of time in Genesis 2. That Adam and Eve walked and talked with their creator. They enjoyed the intimacy of a relationship with him. They knew him. And this passage describes by grace, the Son of God has power to give eternal life. Folks, some will try to tell you that there are many ways to God. Jesus, according to this passage, he holds the authority. We read a couple weeks ago from John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father apart from me. Folks, Jesus alone holds the authority. There's not a thousand roads to God. There is one, and it's through Jesus Christ. He alone holds authority. He alone is the God of grace who extends eternal life to all those who will believe. And I just want you to pause before this great overcoming Savior and marvel at him. Stand in awe of the God of grace who would give his life for your ransom and hold the key to offer eternal life to you. This is Jesus Christ, and it's purely of his grace that anyone ever comes to know God. None of us could ever earn it or deserve it. And the invitation of this section, and really the whole of the Gospel of John is, would you accept the Son? Believe in Jesus. John ends his Gospel in John 20, 31. He's talking about, he's written all these things, he says. They're written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, by believing, you may have life in his name. The call of the Gospels is, this is this awe, glorious God of grace 
Believe him. Believe in his death in your place. Believe in his powerful resurrection. Truly accept him as your Savior. And I just ask you today, do you stand in awe of him? Do you stand in awe of this great God who would take on flesh and, and die in our place? This passage really starts to lay out some amazing truths of the gospel, doesn't it? The amazing benefits of Easter. We have access with God. We, we, we can follow an action to faith because Jesus overcome, not because we're great, but because we trust in him. And we can just stand in awe of God. Now, some of you right now are tempted to kind of fall back to your own thinking. Your own strength. I just need to try, I need to kind of get myself cleaned up. Go part way. That is not the gospel. Today, I, I implore you like this text, simply believe. Simply believe. Jesus alone did what only he could do. On the cross, the cry is, it is finished. That's it. Jesus paid it all. There's nothing that you can do to measure up, to get part way, to clean yourself up so that he'll view you as acceptable. The Father himself loves you. The Father gave his son Jesus on the cross. He rose again. And he offers to you eternal life, this God of glory and of grace. This passage takes uh, an, an extremely complex thing about how we relate to God, and it makes it extremely simple. And it puts in front of you and I, Jesus Christ. What will you do with Jesus? Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the, the grace of the gospel today. Thank you for this day, especially, where we pause and we remember and we celebrate your great kindness to us. Lord, I pray that, that you'd help us to respond. Oh God, I pray that you'd help us not to just come today and merely think of the information of a text of Scripture, but that the clarity of this text would speak to hearts and lives, Lord, the great benefits of Easter, the great benefits of your great love to us. Thank you, God, for your mercy. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.